good evening uh, welcome to buddhism as lived experience mountain lecture series uh, with dr Lank louis lancaster jointly organized by the department of religious study and ariel graduate council and sponsored by the institute for the study of humanistic buddhism university of west i'm miro sakya chair of the department of religious study and before we begin i would like to request our president of the university, Dr. Minhuatha, to say a few words. I just want to say hi to everyone and thank you very much for joining us again. Um, and uh, thank you. Today, it is a great honor and pleasure to welcome and introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Louis Lancaster. Now, Dr. Louis Lancaster is Emeritus Professor of the Department of East Asian Language at the University of California, Berkeley, and the University of West. Dr. Lancaster has been tirelessly offering lectures on various topics of Buddhism for eight months now. His insightful lectures have been giving us inspiration, serenity, and comfort we need during this time of pandemic that is full of suffering and uncertainty so when, be, when we began this monthly lecture series, we had no idea that it would impact so many people in such a positive way. So we have received feedback so far has been amazing. So I want to thank Dr. Lancaster from the depth of my heart for his service and dedication. Today, he's going to talk about one of the most important topic of Buddhism, enlightenment, distant, beacon. Enlightenment is an English word that can mean several things. In the West, the age of enlightenment was a philosophical movement of the 17th and 18th century that promoted science and reason over meat and superstition. So enlightenment in Western culture is often associated with intellect and knowledge, but Buddhist enlightenment is something else. In today's talk, Dr. Lancaster will explain what does Buddhist enlightenment means. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Lancaster. Thank you very much, uh, Rose and President Ta, and all of you who helped to make this possible. I really appreciate it. And I wish all of you uh, Happy Buddha's birthday, since that's, we are right there. So tonight I share some thoughts about enlightenment, a distant beacon. <clears throat> so Chris, can you, uh, Thank you. <clears throat> Happy to be with all of you again. Well, for, for many people, the idea of enlightenment is like a distant beacon that always may be beyond our reach. Now, as Morose just mentioned, enlightenment has been defined and redefined interpreted, analyzed over the centuries. But the surprising fact is that seldom do we find a description of what it is like to experience it. Well, when I, I started my preparation for this lecture, I found myself in the usual state of realizing how limited my knowledge Um, when I told my younger sister what I was giving this lecture on, she said, brother, I think you're in over your head. <laughs> I think she was right. In my six decades of study of Buddhism, I should certainly have come to know 
a reasonable definition for enlightenment. And yet it still seems very elusive to me. However, as I prepared for this, I call to mind a moment when it was described to me by someone who felt he had achieved it. The story started uh, one night in Taiwan. It was nearing 10 at night, and after a busy day, I was thinking of going to bed. The phone rang, an acquaintance was on the other end insisting that I get ready to go with him. He told me there was a monk who lived in the mountains who was willing to see me that very night. So we got in his car and drove up into the hills near Taipei. A difficult drive because a cloud had settled on the heights and we could hardly see the road. Finally arriving very late because we had to drive so slowly in the fog, we were admitted to the quarters of the monk. He was gracious, at ease, even with the invasion of a foreigner in the middle of the night. He asked me, what would I, I like to know? For a moment, I was taken aback since I thought that he would be ready immediately to give me some teaching. I was very struck by his presence, his calmness, his lack of an agenda. My question to him was about how he came to be like he was. He didn't reject such a blunt request and in a most kindly fashion began to share with me. He told me of his long years of meditating until one day he had what he described and identified as his enlightenment. He lost all feeling of separation from the world or the cosmos. He became one with the whole and had great bliss. He said, and I quote him, it was something that seemed quite unlike any experience of thought. It was just being without thinking. He said, I was just being and not thinking in my normal way. There was no sensation, no feeling of pain or ease, no charting of time, whether past, present, or future, no idea of self, but no arising of the opposite idea of no self. He continued, it was not like a coma or unconsciousness, quite the opposite. It was having full alertness, but with no thoughts or feelings. For some hours, he reported that he had stayed in this state until the first rays of the sun lit his room at dawn. And with the light came the awareness of breathing. And for some time, there was only inhaling and exhaling, not tied to anything else. After some time of this first return to the world of thought and experience, one by one thoughts appeared to him. To his surprise, they were the same thoughts that he had the previous day before his enlightened state had occurred. He began to feel discomfort from sitting so long, thirst, a feeling of hunger, 
worry about what was happening. And finally, impatience with the arising of all these old thoughts. So I asked him how he dealt with this high state he had described as enlightenment and the erosion of it as thought after thought spring to consciousness. I, I just could not miss the opportunity to ask questions that I felt that he, at that moment, uh, that he could answer. So what I ask, what is the benefit of this enlightenment? It must have seemed to him that I was downplaying the significance of what he had to teach by wondering whether there was any use for this experience. I guess you could say in a less polite fashion, I was asking, what good is all this in your daily life? Well, he took no offense and he answered me. But I think studying my reactions to each statement before proceeding. So he said, enlightenment that I lived for the first time that night years ago is just the reality that surrounds us. It is not, he said, something that is either far distant nor near at hand. It just is. Having the awareness of the presence of enlightenment gives me moments of ease, free from anguish. He went on, it has allowed me to live my long life with contentment. And sometimes I return through meditation to just being and stay with that reality for some hours. And that su helps sustain me with how I relate to others, to my aging body, to every life moment. It is, he said, a wonderful tool to help in facing the storms of worry, pain, and fear. I had, he, he reported, an experience which came upon me suddenly and without any warning signal. For the first time, I knew what the text meant when they said that enlightenment is sudden. But as the old patterns of thoughts and feelings and emotions came back into view, I realized, he said, that while enlightenment is sudden, the practice of it in our lives is gradual. It is like a tool that I could use to deal with the all the thoughts that swarmed once again in my head. Having known what it was like to be without them, he reported, they all appeared in a very different light. They were like flashes of light arising one after another in rapid succession. Not one of these thoughts stayed for more than a split second before another took its place. Now, every morning when I awake, I use my enlightenment to put all the thoughts into perspective, to know them as they are, momentary and without any power to stay with me. I came, he said, to realize that I had to go on living an ordinary life. 
getting up, eating, bathing, teaching, reading, planning. At first, it seemed, he said, that enlightenment was like a distant beacon, only accessible in special moments of intense concentration. But then he reported, I began to notice that I could feel the enlightenment at any moment of the day. I could feel it in the midst of cascade of worries and fears. It is always there. But when a thought arises, it is replaced for a moment. However, when my thought flashes and fades away in a moment, there is, he said, just a tiny window before the next thought arises. And then in that hiatus, enlightenment takes over only to be replaced by another thought and reappearing when that thought fades. Well, I realized that I was finally meeting someone who seemed to have experienced consciousness without content. In psychological communities, there is by no means great support for this idea that consciousness can be without content. And I cannot hope to solve the problem or even reach a firm conclusion during this talk. Let me just say that as I listened that night on the cloud shrouded mountain in Taiwan, I heard the monk recount the event which he called enlightenment. And from what he described, it met all the standards of being consciousness without content. Only with the morning light did content once again begin to reappear in his normal state of mind. Now from the few studies that have been made, people who have this feeling of being in a state without any thought, they are all transformed by it. Now, in the Pali Canon, there is a description of a man sleeping under a mango tree. And in that deep sleep, there is no thought or content. A mango falls from the tree and awakens him. The text says that while in his deep, dreamless sleep, he was in what they call babanga a passive state that exists in the mind whenever there is no active state. Well, the minute the mango fell on him, Bavanga was immediately replaced by active thought. When he realized what had happened, he returned to his sleep and Bavanga was once again once again, replaced all his thoughts of mango, tree, ground. Hearing what the old monk described seemed to me to be an example of this process, whereby continuity of consciousness occurs, perhaps consciousness without content, and it is interrupted by sensory generated momentary thoughts. It rises to prominence only at the moment a thought flashes and disappears. Well, 
to re return to my questioning the value of the state that the monk had achieved, I understood him to say that he had continued to sit in meditation throughout the night, filled with his bliss. And when he emerged from that state the next moment, he remembered and rejoiced at his experience. However, as the day wore on to his surprise and chagrin, he realized that he still had to face everyday life. And some of it made him impatient. And he even felt a surge of anger. He could re-enter his blissful state when he meditated. But when the world impinged on him, faced with the old patterns of thought and behavior, he faced them. It was then that he realized that his enlightenment was like a wonderful tool. He had to use it to deal with life's experience. So he said that he had learned that his ingrained habits, his attitudes of a lifetime, his prejudices, his impatience were still present. It was, he remarked, as if his brain had deep gorges that had been created over his whole life and even his former lives. The concentration that he had mastered had given him a way to slowly, every day practice the removal of his deep patterns of behavior. His solace was to read the works of Tsung Mi, a great master in ancient Chinese Buddhism. Tsung Mi taught that in light, the enlightened moment is immediate, but the practice that follows it is gradual. This is the reversal of what some taught that first comes gradual practice and then the flash of enlightenment. For the old monk on, on that Taiwan mountain, his never to be forgotten flash of enlightenment was with him at all times. And he had for years continued to use the insight to remove the three poisons, greed, hate, and delusion. I admit that I do not quite know what to do with these descriptions. I didn't know what to do then either. So I just put them aside and decided to direct my attention elsewhere. Then one day on my car radio, I heard the most in remarkable interview. It was with Dr. Jill Bolt Taylor, a neuroscientist from Harvard, who was a member of the staff of the Brain Research Center. When she was 37, she had a stroke. Being fully aware of the symptoms, she knew it that it was serious and massive. She recognized that the trauma was in the left lobe of her brain. And as a result, judgment, sense of ego, and content of consciousness was fast fading. What she began to experience was a surprise. Brain chatter was shut off. Worry about the stroke and the problems in life left her. Like the monk, distinction between her body and the world space dissolved. She felt at one with the flow of existence. Her mother was sitting beside her bed you can imagine 
knowing that her daughter's brain might be damaged beyond recovery. To her amazement, her stricken daughter, unable to speak, smiled. It appeared that rather than pain and suffering, she was in bliss. It angered her mother to think that she could smile at such a time. Her mother said she wanted to shake her and said, do you understand what's happening to you? But there it was before her, the smile. When I heard that broadcast, I immediately thought of the, what the monk had shared with me. There was a reality to consciousness that had no content. Now, Dr. Taylor fortunately recovered. But she said that once having had the experience, when life becomes too stressful, she can return to the state which she describes as retreating to the right lobe of the brain. The stroke had transformed her. Meditation had transformed the monk. We're told in the text that there are two kinds of nirvana. One is the nirvana that occurs while we're still alive with our human forces. It is called nirvana with remainder. Like the sleeper under the tree, it can be interrupted and replaced with the everyday world. While the doctor had suffered a profound trauma, she could still make use of the experience of a damaged brain to give her ease. Well, I don't want to trivialize, trivialize enlightenment when I tell the story of people's experiences. However, over the years, I have been time and again faced with examples that do not seem remote from the experiences of the monk on the mountainside in Taiwan. And my question has remained, is there any benefit for these moments of consciousness without content in a real life situation? Well, before his untimely death, I heard an interview with the famed basketball star of the Los Angeles Lakers, Kobe Bryant. He recounted that both he and his fans recognized that in some games, he entered what he called the zone. During this state of consciousness, the roar of the crowd faded away, the desire to complete a pass, make a basket, achieve a victory. They were no longer with him. He was at one with the court, the arena, the ball, the basket net. And during those times, he seldom missed a shot. Even the excited members of the watchers recognized that he was in an altered state and they would chant zone, zone, zone. Colby said he had a, a narrow range of action if he wanted to remain in the zone. He could not let in thoughts, feelings, or sounds. When the thoughts returned, the sensations, he was left to struggle to make baskets, complete passes, achieve victory. I cannot tell you for sure whether the monk, the neuroscientist, the professional basketball player were having similar states. 
I don't know how one might prove it. However, I think the similarities are too striking to be overlooked. It is possible to take from the examples assurance that there is value in being able to have moments when we are free of our normal thinking process. One of the portals for entering such a state is through meditation. However, there are other potential ways to reach the equivalent experiences. Focused activity of many kinds can open up part of this state. Well, while I may never achieve the states that have been described, the value of having any experience of a heightened state of awareness that is without the content of my normal flow of thought seems to be within reach and to be of great value. So perhaps enlightenment is not so distant after all, not so separated from us in our daily life. Perhaps it is not so distant from us at this very moment. Thank you. Thank you, Lou, uh, for a wonderful and insightful talk. You explain such a complex topic in a simplistic way that is truly outstanding. So here we begin uh, our question and session. And please write uh, your question in the chat box. I don't see any. I will ask the first question. Uh, in Mahayana Buddhism, uh, like a bodhisattva, uh, always uh, we, we hear that he has spent final attainment in order to help those who are still on the path of deliberation. So, but we also uh, know that there is a non-fixed nirvana, right? non-fixed nirvana in Sanskrit, apratistha nirvana. So why does like a uh, what is the difference you know, between like abiding nirvana or non-abiding nirvana? And what is non-fixed nirvana? Could you please explain? Uh, Maroj, that's <laughs> you ask a very difficult question. <clears throat> if this state of consciousness without content is always available, always there, but we replace it with an active thought. Then one way to try to come back to it is to have some way to still the active thought and have that same moment of consciousness without content arise again. Now you, you can't say that I'm going to cling to this nirvana. <laughs> I'm gonna to cling to this state of consciousness without any content, because if you could cling to it, it would have content. If there's no content, you what are you gonna hold on to? There's nothing to hold on to. So I'm trying to see if I can understand enlightenment as something which is 
as the old monk said, I keep thinking what he said, he said, it's all around us all the time. So if it's all around us all the time, what does it look like and where is it and how do, how do I experience it? Thank you. Thank you, Lua. I got I one see a question so, here. Uh, Dr. Ko, uh, question. Yeah, read your question. Do you sure. think consciousness without grabbing content could, could be more close to so called enlightenment experience? Well, I think, Joran, that as I understand it, and all of you understand, I hope you know, I don't tell you that I'm absolutely the grandmaster of all this. I am not. But if I'm grabbing onto something, that's a thought, that's an action. When I'm grabbing and holding, I don't think I can have this experience. Because just in the act of grabbing or trying to grab implies that I, I don't feel myself at one with everything. I see something out there that I want and I have the thought, I want that. And, and then my brain goes fully to work. And I lose that moment of having consciousness without any content. Now, of course, if we're going to live our life, we have to have thoughts. And the monk was saying to me, what I understood him to say is, that's the way it ought to be. But if you know that this other thing is always there, those thoughts take on a completely different appearance. And if the thought is really disturbing or really upsetting to me, I can imagine that without much effort, maybe I can move back into that other state and learn how to face all the problems and the difficulties and the anguish of life with the awareness that I have a tool, that I have something I can, I can use. Thank you, Luke. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, another question from Pasquel. Uh, in, in the term consciousness without an object, the same idea? Uh, if so, are you familiar with the work of Franklin Merrill Wolf? Uh, I'm sorry to say I'm not uh, familiar with his work. Um, but uh, As I understand what, what was being said to me, that when one is in a state where you still have consciousness in, in an awareness, but with no content. And that that's that's the that's the crux of this argument. Is there such a thing? Can we have that? But uh, I will certainly consult and, and see what Mr. Wolf says. Uh, I'm always anxious to get a, a better grip on this. Thank you. Uh, next question from Dr. Jane Iwamura. Can you elaborate between the relationship between enlightenment as you have defined it, and consciousness without content, and 
right action and compassion. Oh, uh, if, if uh, Jane, if the monk is correct that it is always there, that is the consciousness without content is, is always with us in some degree or other. And that being able to access it, I'd use the word, not sure it's the right word. Uh, if that is what the enlightenment experience is for people, it's not as if they are somehow identical, but yet there's no way to pull them apart. Then when we come to right action and, and compassion, uh, I think I, I, I believe I, I'm not going to try to answer you tonight because if I do, uh, I will get into my last lecture. <laughs> my last lecture next month is on behavior. And the question that I will try to deal with in some depth then will be, what is it when, when I do act and think against the backdrop of this type of consciousness? So uh, I'm sorry, Jane, uh, I'll have to ask you to wait. Next question from Steve Kwan. In the way we cannot be knowing when we are in enlightenment, no content, only experience unawaring, unawarely. That seems to be what, what the monk was talking about. We think that experience means, awareness means I'm, I'm thinking thoughts. That consciousness is, is a thought. It has content normally. But if, if there is such a thing as having this form of consciousness, which has no such content, then I, I think that uh, we should try to understand that. I think that uh, the good doctor from her brain trauma seems to have entered into such a state from trauma I don't think you have to be traumatized to reach enlightenment, but, and I think that Kobe Bryan entered into it from years and years of concentrated practice and concentration on his body and his, the art of, of playing as he did. But I think that I sometimes I, I think that if I have had this, there are times when I'm writing at my computer and I realize that I've been writing for some time without thinking. And what I've written is the best stuff I've ever written. If I can get to that stage where I'm just so focused and so in, into it that I'm not thinking now I'm going to write this sentence and now I'm going to say this and now I'm going to try to explain this, where the, the idea and, and everything just seems to flow 
and I'm not even there. And it's almost like somebody else is typing <laughs> and somebody else has written those words. And I'm amazed sometimes at what I've written and I think, do I know that? <laughs> is that really me? So um, I think that all of you probably, I would suspect, have some experience similar. That you have those moments in your life where your focus and your concentration uh, leads you to, to an experience where you're not in a, you're not unconscious, you're not in a coma, you just are doing something. I think some people may have it when they drive. Have you ever driven for some miles and realized I haven't thought about what I'm doing and where I'm driving and, and how to turn the wheel and how to put on the brake? I haven't been thinking about any of that. I've just been in another state, but yet I've, I've been able to drive down the freeway. I sometimes worry that maybe the people on the freeway are in one of these states and I hope they do not have to drive. So my, 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 my search is, is it all around us all the time? And if so, how do we access it? Thank you, Luke. Next question from our graduate student, Senegal Pamiyarati. It seems that many people today do not like to get enlightenment. What do you think about this? So I'd have to ask them first, what, what do they think enlightenment is? Their interpretation or their definition of enlightenment might well be something that I would ever want to have. Um, so when when I when somebody says that they don't like something, then I think it's really important to say exactly what is it that you don't want, and is that what I'm talking about? I have never heard anybody who has had like Kobe Bryant, where you have this experience where somehow you just do almost remarkable things in a, in a, in a state which is not normal thinking. Usually none of, no, nobody like, he, he doesn't complain about it and say it's a bad thing. He wanted it. He knew he did better when he could have it. And you don't want it all the time. As I said, we need to think, we need to be with people, we need to eat. And that's what the old monk said, that I realized I have to eat, I have to, I have to do my work, I have to write, I have to do whatever I have to do. The question is, doing it uh, in what fashion? Thank you. Uh, another question from Jessica Chang. Is consciousness without content deemed enlightenment or just momentary, momentary pavanga process as the greed, hatred, and delusion may not be entirely eradicated as it. Um, I didn't give that to me again. I will re uh, read again. Is consciousness without content deemed enlightenment or just momentarily the process 
as the greed, hatred, and delusion may not be entirely eradicated as it question mark. Well, I think that the Buddhists uh, never meant for, they never defined bhavanga as enlightenment as such. They said bhavanga is a way to explain how we have continuity of consciousness. Because otherwise, life would become very uh, chopped up. We have a thousand thoughts that are each one very distinct. So we're not living in a continuous stream. We're living in blip, 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 blip. So how, how do you have continuity? And so Bhavanga says the continuity is that there is a state which is always available and it will always turn back on when the active state is turned off. So there is continuity. That was that would be why they were, that was one of the reasons why that was made in terms of trying to develop an idea of how, how it is that we have continuity, even though every single thought is just a flash. How do you, how do you make continuity out of that? And this was a way of trying to, to see continuity. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Uh, next question from Milan Sake. Uh, he's my brother from Nepal. Uh, according to you, when our consciousness no longer grabs the contents at any moment, that is enlightenment itself. Is this consciousness without content is what is known as an instant enlightenment? If so, what is the key difference between instant enlightenment and perfect enlightenment that Lord Buddha had attended? Well, I told you about the two nirvanas. Um, and the reason for the two nirvanas was that when the Buddha was under the Bodhi tree at Bodh Gaya, on the night of his enlightenment, he achieved nirvana, but he was still alive. He, had, he still had to live out the rest of his life. So that was, that was trying to explain to people what happened to Shakyamuni when he had this experience and, and why didn't it stay with him? Now, for some people, uh, a Pracheka Buddha, uh, there was the idea that some, some people who achieve these high states just stayed with it until they died. They didn't do anything. They didn't help anybody. They didn't have any action. It was just too good. So we have in the Buddhist story, the gods coming down when they saw Shakyamuni in this state or the Buddha at that point and said, oh, please teach, please share. Don't just sit in this blissful state. But again, uh, I want to talk about this more next time, so I, I will go no further with that. But it's the questions you're asking are very good, and I'm 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 not giving you really adequate answers. We need all of us to keep thinking about these questions and to see them in our own lives and see them in what we we have. I. I have come to the place in my own life where I realize uh, everything around me 
is a potential teacher. Everything. So, <laughs> two days ago, I was walking, taking my walk. You know, I take this famous walk I take every day. And I came to the beautiful yellow rose bush. And it's just magnificent. And I stood there and looked at it and said, you must be trying to teach me something. What, what is it you're teaching me? You've attracted my attention. And here I am standing in front of you in awe of your beauty. What are you trying to teach me? <laughs> Teachers are all around us. And we need to we need to try to figure out when we're being taught. Uh, thank you. Uh, last question from Danny Tam. What kind of enlightenment will be the prison inmate at in inside the prison? Well, Danny, uh, you and Shirley certainly know, and Venerable D, all of you know much more about that than I, but my experience with the prisoners is, has been that over the years of seeing the same people, if they are meditating, and I go back to see them after a year or after two years, the only way I've described it is I, I look around the room and I can see that certain people have changed dramatically. They look different, their face is different. And I think to myself, it looks like that person has awakened. In other words, I think that those prisoners who really meditate in prison have as much opportunity or maybe even more to reach this great state of consciousness without content in a way, because they, they have the, they, they can sit for hours. I just remember the story of, of one of our meditators who, who broke the rule, unfortunately, and they put him in solitary confinement as punishment and he, he was sitting in meditation in solitary confinement and finding that he could reach these states of e with ease and he was enjoying it. And when the guards realized he's not being punished by being in there, he's really enjoying that. They put him back into the regular uh, sleeping quarters with the other monks because they're they want to punish him. And this was not punishment. He was able to achieve a state of ease, even in solitary confinement. So the question I would say is, of course they can, they can achieve this. And they do. I think they do. Uh, and some of the remarkable changes that have occurred to people who are practicing meditation, as uh, Venerable D just told me before we came on. Someone who is in prison without um, life, without parole, because of the changes that were made in his life by being a meditator and working with the Buddhist groups, uh, the guards and everyone else recognizing it they requested and finally got that sentence changed. And that's, that doesn't happen all the time. These people uh, who, anybody who, who touches into something like what I have described, they get transformed. 
they get transformed. Their life is always different after that. I'm sorry that I can't give you uh, more definitive answers and I'm sorry that I can't tell you here, I'm an enlightened person, let me tell you what it's like. <laughs> I, I'm not able to do that. But I ask you all to think of yourselves. Dr. Langston, you are more enlightened than all of us. <laughs> think of yourself as, as potentially an enlightened person and try to find it in each of us to find it in our experience. So I thank you all. Thank you, Lou, for your outstanding talk. Uh, now we have only one lecture left, and that lecture uh, is scheduled for Tuesday, June 15 at 7 p.m. And Dr. Lancaster already mentioned the topic of the uh, his class lectures, behavior, act of consequences. I hope you all can join it again. At last, I would like to thank uh, President Ta, Dr. Ibn Mira, Dr. Susan Cole, Christopher Johnson, Venable B. Hong, Venable Srinanda, and Hong San for their assistance and encouragement. And thank you everyone for attending. Stay safe. Have a good night. Thank you, Dr. Lancaster. Thank you, Miroj. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Lancaster. Good night. Thank you all. Good to see thank you. Thank you, everyone. Namo Good night. Thank you.